Good evening and uh, a very warm welcome to everyone here and on the YouTube channel. Uh, and welcome to the Vivekananda lecture series. This is season two, uh, 2023. In season one, uh, this, is, this is a series of 12 lectures that we've planned uh, on Vivekananda. And we've had multiple speakers speaking on uh, a particular aspect of uh, the uh, of Swamiji. And therefore, uh, you know, we plan to have 12 lectures and this is the seventh in the uh, series of 12. So, uh, Sri Aurobindo, speaking of Vivekananda, once said, we perceive his influence still working gigantically. We know not well how, we know not well where. In something that is not yet formed, something leonine, grand, intuitive, upheaving that has entered the very soul of India. That was Aurobindo's, uh, because he himself was quite inspired by the uh, by Swami Vivekananda and, the, and his message. It is this fragrance of his influence that lingers on and con continues to inspire, motivate and guide each one of us at the Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement, at the Vivekananda Institute for Leadership Development and the Vivekananda Institute of Indian Studies. Uh, today for the second episode of season two and the seventh episode overall, it's, it's my absolute pleasure to have a veteran journalist and commentator Sri Surajit Dasgupta. Uh, Surajit Dasgupta began his career as a banker with Citibank and then switched to journalism. He has worked with the statesman, uh, the pioneer, uh, Swarajya, Hindustan Samachar, My Nation, etc. and established his own media houses, Sirf News and Swadharma. His professional career spans 30 years. He is a mathematician by training and has acute interest in science and technology linguistics and history. He is also a Sangeet Visharad and, uh, uh, and somebody who has also been a very dear friend and who I consider a co-traveler in the, in, in the spiritual journey. An absolute pleasure to have, uh, have you on this uh, talk, uh, Surajit. And the format of this uh, lecture would be that, uh, you know, Surajit Dasgupta would speak for about 20 to 25 minutes. And the topic is Swami Vivekananda and the power of his words, given that, you know, Surajit consistently works with words and works on words. Therefore, I thought this would be the most apt topic uh, that uh, we could uh, give him. After the 25 minute uh, opening remarks, we will move to about 20 minutes of uh, Q&A. And I would request uh, finally, Mr. Sampath Kumar to give the closing remarks for today. It's over to you, Surajit. Namaskar. Thank you, Ramesh, for the wonderful introduction. I hope I am audible clearly. The aspect of Swami Vivekananda that uh, I have been asked to speak on is uh, something that should uh, come to me naturally. Uh, and yet, when I go through the body work of what he did in his very short life, I'm overwhelmed. Uh, I fail to figure where to start, how much to cover, and what all things I'll end up leaving out inadvertently. There is so much to say about each of his speeches, and not only speeches, also his conversations. Very often he was put into situations that uh, theologians generally do not encounter. Uh, kind of hostile situation, a kind of uh, environment where your audience does not agree with you. And yet he emerged from each of those sessions with flying colors, with every part of the audience impressed by what he said and the sincerity of what he said and also the authenticity of what he said. In fact, when he was uh, much younger in his formative years, his teachers, his professors used to be spellbound by his uh, memory power, by his ways of articulation. And they were always stunned to see how much this young lad knew. Uh, sometimes they even did, were not sure that he had the time to go through the great works that were already in place before him. And yet he seemed, 
he appeared very confident about the things that he spoke of. But uh, I have tried my best to put his works, especially with focus on uh, the choice of his words, his articulation, his polemics, his oratory, etc., into certain salient points, which I would like to take the audience through one by one. First of all, the art of capturing the audience. Swami Vivekananda was a master at uh, capturing the audience's attention. So when he began, as is famously known, in the Parliament of World Religions in 1893, the very opening address, so brothers and sisters of America, that was not something that speakers were used to saying while opening their remarks those days. It used to be ladies and gentlemen, and that too in uh, Chicago, in the United States, it was quite unheard of. It may come to us Indians very naturally. Uh, while speaking in Hindi, Devyo or Sajjano, Bhaiyo, Bano, etc. But the white West was unaware of this. So that was something that can never be recalled enough. The way he started the speech. And, uh, you know, even the other people who introduced him or were uh, uh, made to comment on how he had performed on that world stage. And then there was uh, Dr. Barrows, for example. He said, India, the mother of religions, was represented by Swami Vivekananda, the orange monk who exercised the most wonderful influence over his auditors. So you would see in certain parts of uh, uh, my presentation that there are certain words that have changed their meanings or we express those ideas using a different sort of or different kind of words these days. For example, we just heard uh, Dr. Barrows use the word auditor. Nowadays, we uh, associate that word with uh, chartered accountancy and uh, we would rather say the audience. Similarly, you would see in uh, the writings and speeches of Swami Vivekananda a word coming time and again, toleration. We use tolerance these days. Anyway, so the first point was capturing audience. This was an art, I think, uh, comes very innately. It is not something uh, that you are trained in. Of course, these days there are uh, courses available on how to be a good uh, speaker, how to capture the audience's attention right from the word go. But then such facilities were not available back in the late 19th century. And yet he performed so well, he just mesmerized the audience. And to this day, more than a hundred years later, we are still studying that particular a uh, speech that was all of 458 words, which means it might have lasted at the most five or six minutes. And what are we comparing this to? If you look at the uh, analyses of some of the greatest speeches made in world history, this comes right on top, followed by a speech by Abraham Lincoln. And so there was one speaker before uh, Swami Vivekananda and one years, decades after, who are ranked likewise. So number one, Swami Vivekananda, 1893. Then there is Abraham Lincoln's Gettysburg uh, Address. So, and then much later in the 20th century, Nelson Mandela's speech at his trial in 1964. So this is the level. This is the quality. This is the standard that we are talking about. So now I move on to the next uh, aspect, the next point. Very remarkable thing about Swami Vivekananda's thought much before it came to speech. 
it, it was the clarity, the sheer clarity. He was very clear in what he thought and what he meant. And in a time when every religion claimed their superiority, Swamiji gave a very clear message. I'll just make one quote to further this point of clarity of thought. I do not come, he said, to convert you to a new belief. I want you to keep your own belief. I want to make the Methodist a better Methodist, the Presbyterian a better Presbyterian, the Unitarian a better Unitarian. I want to teach you to live the truth, to reveal the light within your own soul. So while I was reading this, a very contemporary and recent uh, phenomenon in politics came to mind, Vivek Ramaswamy. If you see how uh, he is capturing the audience in the same country, the United States, and being from the same root as all of you and me, uh, India, here you would see that the way Vivek Ramaswamy addresses the American audience that he knows very consciously, is very conscious about the fact that these, this is by and large a white West Christian population, Christian being the most important qualification of that audience. Now, how do you make a speech in a manner not to offend them, and yet in a manner that you cannot call is inaccurate. So when Swami Vivekananda says that he wants a Methodist to be a better Methodist, a Presbyterian to be a better Presbyterian, the Unitarian to be a better Unitarian, he is actually not trying to turn the audience so unreceptive that they wouldn't even care for what the rest of the speech is. So there is a little politics involved here. That is, you do not antagonize, you do not turn the audience averse to you. If you have to mold what you want to say, what you need to say in a manner that gels with the quality of audience that you have, you must do that. And in doing so, Recently, we had this unfortunate incident where uh, somebody from ISKCON made a very negative remark about Swami Vivekananda without knowing the context in which it was said. So there are several anecdotes related to Swami Vivekananda that come to mind where you would see that making a point, conveying the message is so important that sometimes you may want to mold your story, alter your story slightly, just so that the message is conveyed without getting into the nitty gritties of how accurate that is. So for example, there was a tale, a story that uh, Swami, Vivekananda, uh, Swami Vivekananda related to once, and it appeared in the Northampton Daily Herald on, eight, on uh, 11th of April, 1894. It's a very brief story. It is about what we in Sanskrit say, Kupa Manduka, a frog of a well. And there you would see that uh, Swami Vivekananda is comparing a frog living in a well where one fine morning, a frog from the sea jumps in or falls, and then the frog of the well boasts how big a place the well is. Well, we all know that frogs do not live in the sea. But then that is a compromise you make. That is a slight tweaking of the story that you do to make the point as to what a Kupa Manduka is. A person confined in a very, very limited space, but if that is that limited space is all that the person has seen ever. He might think that is the greatest place ever, that is the biggest place ever. And so the frog from the sea is just amused. 
he runs he finds himself short of words how to exclaim and how to tell the frog in the well that there is a much bigger world out there so here the second lesson is if you need to tweak a story a little so that you get better audience always do that there the accuracy of what you say is not important then we have nowadays people who uh, work on the web space everything that you do nearly everything that you do comes on the web also in some form or the other even if it's a television channel they feel the need to have a website as well they also feel the need to have a youtube channel and then uh, those who manage that are always told for a better seo search engine optimization you must always call for action this phrase is used nowadays in the web space call for action in swami vivekananda's speeches and also conversations you would find several instances of calls for action they, he provoked action so it, for example in advertisement it is said that if the slogan of your product or of your brand does not contain a verb it only has nouns and adjectives and other statements that is this is this we are the best we are the best is not a good uh, uh not supposed to be a good slogan if you have to sell it because everybody will say it is the best now even considering that it is the best what is the customer going to do about it you need to ask the customer to buy the product so this is this is something that is very important also while delivering a speech or while making an argument when you are provoking an action that action may be in by way of a thought so that biggest success for any orator is that he is able to provoke action from his listeners so consider any orator any influencer who had followers in lakhs in history in lakhs and crores whether that was a good guy or a bad guy when it came to judging the performance as a speaker they were always spell binding and they were spell binding because they provoked action from the audience and swami ji was uh, an example par excellence in this field his his flaming words burning words roused us from the stupor and slumber in which we were snoring this this is a a descriptor i found somewhere and i found it very uh, very true very apt because uh, again a very common experience many of you uh, may relate to as a part of the audience if not as a speaker that when somebody is making a presentation midway through it some people doze off some people lose interest and leave the auditorium such things never happen in the case of swami vivekananda and one person one eminent person who recognized that he he was inspired a lot by how vivekananda called for action and he actually went on to that person was he, he actually went out to uh make something tangible inspired by what he had heard vivekananda say because vivekananda would always urge his audience to be with the times to understand the need of the times and this person was jamshed ji tata while founding the indian institute of science he made this point in his opening speech that he was inspired to build this institution by none other than swami vivekananda another thing one would note of course there will be some difficulty in getting audio tapes of swami vivekananda but there are a few available and what you would notice in him as well as the few speeches recorded of rishi aurobindo 
and then again uh, netaji subhash chandra bose they of course had the advantage of being taught english by english people and this was something uh, that also helped them connect with the west as much as they connected with the people of their own country because when they spoke to people of their own country they spoke in the mother tongue they spoke their first language but while interacting with the international audience their diction their accent helped a lot this is something which i also keep telling uh, people of this new medium called podcasts that you if you do not have the right accent the right diction maybe there is somebody else in the team who can be in front of the camera who can be behind the mic and do not uh, think that since this is your channel you will do everything you will make the presentations you will write the script you will decide what kind of lighting the studio will have what quality of microphone you will use etc what audio mixer you will use so delegate this duty and come before the camera come uh, you just you stand behind the mic only when you are confident that what you speak will not require subtitles this is very important and uh, you will notice in swami vivekananda's speeches the few that were recorded that he had the right diction to be able to connect to the western audience the next thing that i had also said in my opening remarks was memory now oh, swami vivekananda's memory was extraordinary alongside uh, his uh, study of western philosophers uh, he was also quite thoroughly familiar and acquainted with uh, sanskrit scriptures and many bengali works as well and uh, this was when he was still in the undergraduate program in college several professors testified to this uh, effect and uh, there was one dr william hasty he wrote and i quote narendra as you all must be knowing that his original name swami vivekananda's original name was narendra datta so narendra nath datta so narendra is really a genius this dr william hasty said i have traveled far and wide but i have never come across a lad of his talents and possibilities even in german universities among philosophical students so this was about a boy of 18 just going to be a man while he was in college and he also had a conversation with one dr mahendra lal sarkar and uh, the principal of scottish uh, church college that he was a part of in 1881 to 84 and this this guy was uh, a homeopath doctor social reformer a propagator of scientific studies in 19th century india and the founder of the indian association for the cultivation of science he remarked after listening to swami vivekananda i never thought a young boy could have read so much and it is because of this quality of swami vivekananda that he was often referred to as shruti dhara so he could do dharan he could hold he could retain whatever he heard shruti dhara so he it this was a prodigious memory and uh, his sheer presence his his personality also added to the quality because these aspects also are quite important you would find that uh, there are celebrities for example who come on television and not all celebrities become successful compare for example amitabh bachchan's kaun banega karodpati and there is a bengali program by shourob ganguly dadagiri shourob ganguly uh, 
you know, does not come across as a good presenter at all. Or take for matter uh, uh, commercials where Sachin Tendulkar has lent his voice. It, these were great cricketers, but on camera, that was not their turf. You could see, you could feel uh, that this is, this is not their medium. That was never an issue with Swami Vivekananda. He had the sheer presence, whether you consider his statues at, at different crossroads uh, in different cities, whether you consider his portraits or his real photographs, there is an aura about it. There is this sheer presence that even when he is in a group, he stands out. So then, of course, there is the oratory skills. And uh, these oratory skills were later on taken up by several stalwarts, even from politics. There was uh, Chakravarti Raja Gopalachari, for example, who said that Swami Vivekananda saved Hinduism and he saved India. Uh, Subhash Chandra Bose said Vivekananda was the maker of modern India. And then there were others, there were, as I have already named, Aurobindo Ghosh, there was Bhagajatin. And there is an interesting scene in a film on Subhash Chandra, where uh, I think I might have narrated this in a few other programs earlier, but it was so amusing. Uh, I do not know whether it has really happened or not uh, in that particular way, but it did happen because there are written accounts of it. While trying to arrest our freedom fighters, many a time, British officers, police officers, would raid their houses and run into portraits of Swami Vivekananda. And initially, when they did not know who this is, they used to wonder whether this was some mastermind of a greater plan for revolutionaries to throw out the British. And in the film Subhash Chandra, there is this scene where Subhash is not at home and a British officer walks in, goes straight inside into the bedroom, his study, and finds a big portrait of Swami Vivekananda hanging there. And after not being able to trace Subhash there, while coming out, he asks Subhash's father, who is this guy? Wherever I go, wherever my police team raids, in any freedom fighter's house, we find a, a portrait of this person. Who is he? So such was the uh, magnitude of inspiration that Swami Vivekananda left behind. And he is projected as a role model for youth, even by the Indian government. And that is not surprising at all. What is important here is that uh, in, in the, there, there is something in Hindi called Hazir Jawabi. So when you are confronted with a situation where the person comes from a different belief system and the person is not ready to listen to you, then you provoke a thought, as I said, provoke an action. The thought can be an action. And you are always ready with an answer. That was a quality that Swami Vivekananda had. And uh, you, in doing so, you still make a point that I have something that you don't. Consider that famous speech once again. We believe not only in universal toleration. As I said, some words have changed over the past century. Nowadays, we say tolerance. Back then, the word was toleration. We believe not only in universal toleration, but we accept all religions as true. I'm proud to belong to a nation which has sheltered the persecuted and the refugees of all religions and all nations of the earth. So in one sentence, you are telling the listener that you are with him. In the very next sentence, you're making him realize what he lacks. The West cannot boast of sheltering persecuted and refugees. Whatever they are doing now out of a sense of guilt or because of their newfound woke ideology, that's different. 
but traditionally they have been racist traditionally they have been supremacists traditionally they have always believed that they, it was ordained that they came down on this earth gifted by god or ordered by god to to civilize the rest of the world population that was the attitude they always had which led to imperialism which led to colonization and here in in that 458 word speech you would find almost every alternate sentence once trying to embrace the west and then again telling them what they lack so as the different i quote again as the different streams having their sources in different paths which men take through different tendencies various though they appear crooked or straight all lead to thee thee is the concept of god and now finally i come to the influences while of course uh, swami vivekananda left the world as perhaps the greatest influence any indian icon would ever have on future generations of india he himself had certain influences there there were people and sects and a philosophical school of thoughts that had shaped his thinking but as he evolved as he grew within that short span of uh, less than 40 years he found himself he finally when people recall swami vivekananda they do not say such and such people made him because they actually did not anything that came before swami vivekananda served as a launch pad and it it was not that he was just a replica or a carbon copy of what had been said and thought of before so there these influences are brahmo samaj but as you progress you go more and more towards advaita vedanta and you'll see less less and less of brahmo samaj influence there in his remarkable performance in chicago of 1893 we all thank ramakrishna paramahansa because swami vivekananda uh, was perhaps why well, perhaps in fact he was he was not there with a rehearsed speech he was himself in a kind of trance for those five or six minutes that he took to finish the speech and yet it was sheer hypnosis so there again ramakrishna paramahansa's influence is one influence out of all past influences uh for example other than uh, the other than the brahmo samaj influence there was also western esotericism so this was while synthesizing and popularizing various strands of hindu thought and notably classical yoga and advaita vedanta Vivekananda was also influenced by Western ideas such as uh, universalism. Uh, then the Unitarian missionaries who collaborated with the Brahmo Samaj, but these are influences that faded away as he progressed. But Ramakrishna was one influence that stayed, which is why he institutionalized it in the form of the Ramakrishna mission. So the mission was always of Ramakrishna. He acknowledged that. and then of course he went on to uh, propound several <clears throat> theories of advaita vedanta he he built on them he spoke extensively on samkhya he spoke on yoga and uh, uh, he he also defined in a way indian nationalism nowadays we so often see that india has a hindu nationalist regime right now the west says but our nationalism is of a very different kind it is sublime it is interchangeable with the term patriotism this was something that uh, swami vivekananda helped a lot in shaping and uh, that was the reason that you see so many freedom fighters who swore to him who said they were inspired by swami vivekananda they never talked about 
something like uh, Hitler saying that he has the right or the Aryans have the right to rule over the world. These things never came from our freedom fighters. They never said that once we are free from the British rule, we will go on to establish a larger, greater kingdom comprising all nations of the world because we are the most supreme. That never happened. So uh, this is another something, uh, this is another aspect that must be stressed that our nationalism is different from what the West means uh, from that particular term. And then he also stressed, he emphasized social service a lot. And because of this too, some other sects, some other believers within the Hindu fold sometimes misrepresent him. When, when for example, he says that uh, he would uh, lay more emphasis on playing football than reading Srimad Bhagavad Gita. Why did he see, say that? He actually was not trying to demean the holy text. Once again, he was first trying to connect to the audience. And once the audience was spellbound, once the audience was all ears, because if there is a non-serious, uh, let's say a 15, 16 year old boy or an 11 year boy or a seven, eight year old girls, you find them playing outside somewhere. You cannot start right away by saying, you know how great the Gita is, you cannot. You have to first catch their attention and only then gradually you come to the point you elevate them to a level when they can grasp the Gita. And that is when, if he had to demean uh, uh, Srimad Bhagavad Gita, he could have done it elsewhere. But no, that was only a ploy to grab the attention of the given audience he had at that point of time. So these, uh, uh, these are the things that uh, we need to learn from uh, how this aspect of Swami Vivekananda that I have been asked to speak on, where this assumes extra importance, is how you uh, how you communicate. That is the word communication. For communication, I think there have been several greats in our country, but there have been few who were who were in a league of their own, who did not, who could not be compared to somebody else. There have been other greats like uh, uh, Sri Aurobindo. He wrote excellent in an excellent manner, but you have to be at a certain level to be able to appreciate fully what Sri Aurobindo is trying to convey. Whereas Swami Vivekananda came across situations where he had to deal with kings, he had to deal with urchins, he had to deal with very hostile Western people. And every time he knew how to prevail in that situation, whether it was a uh, one is to one interaction or one to many interaction. Uh, thank you, Ramesh. I can take questions now. Thank you, uh, Surajit. I think uh, I, I must, uh, you know, kind of uh, Say this, I think uh, you you stuck so so very uh, well to the topic uh, that, I, that I asked you to give subject. Absolutely zero digression. I know that you know we've had conversations on Vivekananda even earlier, uh, mm -hmm. the, the both of us, and uh, you know we have kind of spoken for hours together. You know, two and a half, three hours also. We have spoken on several aspects, and uh, yes. it's absolutely great that you stuck to that one thing because, as as you know, this is a very thematic kind of. Uh, series that we're running and uh, the, the and uh, the, the mandate you had was to speak primarily on the power of Swami Vivekananda's uh, words. Right. Yeah. In, in that context, you know, I personally, I myself, uh, right during my school days uh, was inspired by uh, the, the, the Chicago address. You know, there was a very small pamphlet that I actually picked up in the there used to be a Vivekananda ashram in Alsur, which is now in Bangalore. It, it is now called the Ramakrishna uh, Mutt now. Uh, and th there was this very, very, and there was this very small, tiny library because it was a very tiny ashram. 
and the and the first book that i in fact picked up was this uh, uh, you know the chicago address they used to print small pamphlets of it uh, and then and later you know the uh, the uh, vivekananda and his call to the nation and all that i read only later and mm. then moved on to his complete works and i i think you brought out that aspect of the his call to action you know whenever we read you want to do something there have been times for example when you we we kind of get moved into tears you know you can there are times when uh, it, it's it's you're not weeping uh, because you're sad or something but it's just the the power of those uh, words mm-hmm. uh, one of the things that i've always thought is that uh, swami ji became a conduit uh, of uh, sri ramakrishna because uh, uh, and so i i think this was a kind of a, a, a something that was deliberately done by uh, sri ramakrishna and maybe that and and some of the power uh, uh, got translated into into the words that he said i just wanted some thoughts on that from you if we could uh, also look at that aspect of uh, this is one aspect of religion of spirituality that is very difficult to define and uh, delineate uh, either in a speech or in an article this is the word for it is experience what you experience what would any of us experience in the company of ramakrishna paramahansa that is something that uh, swami vivekananda had it was a first hand experience and it lasted a lifetime so this is this is where you come in the sannidhi of your guru this your spiritual master your spiritual guide and there are different kinds of teachers but a spiritual master is one who is not just an external being a human being sitting on a vyasa peetha or in a you know standing and uh, delivering a lecture inside a university classroom those do not have a lasting impact but ramakrishna by his sheer touch of a toe on the forehead of swami vivekananda just changed his life this was this was something he could never had got over with this is this is a power that comes from the divine it is when you do sadhana and you go beyond a certain level when you are one with god and not only you are one with god there is of course a deviation between dvaita and advaita whether you yourself become god or not so there there can be disagreement on that however where there is complete concurrence of thought across the schools of philosophies of hinduism is that when you arrive at a certain point of being a guru you can convey a part of it you can transmit a part of you into your disciple that is what ramakrishna i think did Uh, very efficiently and successfully in the case of swami vivekananda yeah uh, another question you know uh, i know that uh, you know uh, your interests lie in uh, science you, you you in fact if i if i'm not wrong you started out as a uh, somebody who wrote in for wrote yes for science uh, the science right. section of the newspapers right i mean yes yes and and uh, uh, and so uh, in that sense I, i this is a two part question one is how have you been able to i know that also you are, you are an extremely spiritual person and i also know that you've been inspired by swami vivekananda's message so in this two part question i i wanted to ask how have you been able to reconcile uh, science with this with spirituality one and the second is what has swami vivekananda meant to you as a journalist for the last uh, 30 years okay the answer to the first question is very simple the more you know you the more you realize how much you do not know right. and a, as a result uh, when you uh, stick to science beyond your secondary level at the high secondary level in graduation in post graduation you are overwhelmed by the sheer thought as to how much is yet to be known and that hum- humbles you that makes you feel how how small how insignificant a creature you are and so you marvel at the creation you marvel at what the universe is that turns you into a believer 
However, if you only are left with romantic ideas about what science and technology is, because you never learned it after class 10, then of course there are uh, you know, romanticisms about how great it is to be an atheist, how great it is to be a rationalist, but every kind of rationality fails beyond a point in trying to describe anything. Even the simplest of phenomenon in the universe cannot be explained beyond an extent, either by Newton or by Albert Einstein. And this is why you see, even in the recent success stories of ISRO, we have a whole band of scientists who, who swear by their devotion to different deities. They perform rituals before a rocket launch. So this, this was easy. And the second part is this reconciliation. This is a question that came not just before Swami Vivekananda, but several spiritualists, several ascetics, and often in a dialogue between theists and atheists, this thing comes up uh, about inquiry, about uh, proof, about evidence. So then when you are trying to tell a non-believer or you are trying to initiate a little child into a particular religion, you need to understand, you need to appreciate the capacity to which that person can hold what you are saying. For example, in science and technology, as we used to do in the uh, scrapbook for uh, chemistry, there used to be an experiment, an observation, and an inference. This cannot be done in religion. This cannot be done in spirituality. You can do an experiment. When you try to make an observation, your observation will be limited to what your five senses can grasp. And therefore, your inference may be wrong. And then, when a child is told that while you can learn a lot of things about the materialism of this world, the material existence of this world, this is not ultimate knowledge. Ultimate knowledge in whatever sect of whatever religion you are is said to be that, that particular school of philosophy. So when you do that, you do not actually mean, for example, that the four Vedas are a book of physics. Or, or that the Ramayana and Mahabharata can, can be compared to Resnick and Halliday or Irodov's numerical physical problems. No. What you mean is, even after accomplishing what is there to be accomplished in this material world, you will feel a void that cannot be filled. And that for that to fill that void, you need to elevate yourself to a level where you try grasping things that are otherwise not perceptible with the five sense organs. And this is, this is why when situations such as trying to tell uh, uh, a skeptical king, Swami Vivekananda said, you know, trying to explain the importance of murti, of imagery, of icons in Hinduism. It was the king's father who was no more in this world and he asked him to smash the portrait on the ground and step on it and the king refused so that was the that was the level that was the realm where uh, religion pervades where religion lives where you are told that it is there is much beyond what you can perceive with your five sense organs and Religion is an appreciation of that which lies beyond. Uh, second part of the question, uh, Surajit, was on uh, the influence he, he has had on your journalistic, uh, you know, three okay. decades. Uh, yeah, three decades. Right, right, right. So, uh, like the two different streams of work that I have been in, either in banking or, or in journalism, I've always found myself an outlier. So, uh, even in, as a banker, uh, my colleagues at Citibank used to wonder what I was doing there. I did not come across as a typical clerk 
who would just fill the files or process uh, you know loan applications and all that but uh, uh, but uh, uh, there again uh, there were situations since i was in the marketing department of the bank and uh, in marketing you have situations where you compete with your colleagues and uh, while competing it may move a level lower than competition and become rivalry which can turn very bitter i can say very proudly through my 30 years of career in banking and journalism i have never fought with a colleague i have never told a colleague you this this rightfully belonged to me and you have snatched it away from me so there were instances for example in city bank when i was i would arrive in uh, office and find that someone has accessed my register and taken away some references of clients in my place any other person would be would turn livid you know how how can you do that it is in fact even improper behavior but uh, i prioritized my relations with my coworkers more than what i would achieve in that particular office which i always knew was not going to be my permanent office i would move on so similar things have happened in journalism also but what was more important uh, in journalism was what was not what happening what was happening inside a media house but what it was producing for the people at large so there every time i found that it was a very hostile anti hindu environment in every media house including a few that are supposed to be pro india pro hindu from the outside but you go in and you find a whole lot of turn coats from the communist camp from the leftist camp so i had to fight them constantly and where i said that it is more important what you are telling the world so i had to fight over editorials for example uh, talking about uh, swami vivekananda you would uh, see that uh, tantra is given very bad press mm. you, even when a uh, molvi does something wrong the headline in times times of india reads tantric this would never happen in an office where i am working mm. i'll i'll not allow that to happen so uh, you know the uh, very frivolous way of let's say projecting tantra in uh, uh, in z channel for example z news they had carried a series on uh, aghoris it kind of trivialized what aghora is so either you get into something then the shabri mala debate where i was in the shabri mala debate the entire office including some very pro hindu voices were not sure because they were not familiarized with lord ayappa what he stood for what a shastra meant yeah, this was the, when, when you were at swarajya is it that, uh, this was my nation right oh, okay swarajya people were more uh, uh, as as hindus more evolved than <laughs> in 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 my nation they were pro, pro nation voices pro hindu voices but there was a lot of uh, things they did not know uh, they do not know a lot about the gauriya parampara of east and uh, northeast so they know even less about tantra they have almost no idea about a region of bengal called bolpur which is which is kind of a hunt, uh, a, a hub for tantric practices and if you are if you ask them to cover that they would just trivialize the whole thing project a very misleading picture so my presence uh, always helped and then also there is this tendency in journalism it is considered wrongly to be the right form of journalism to be skeptic always regardless of who you are dealing with so when when you are talking about swami vivekananda oh there must be something wrong so why don't we write an article about his tobacco addiction for example so such such nonsense are not tolerated fortunately now i am a senior journalist so they have to listen <laughs> <laughs> so and i i made a lateral entry into this field 
when I had already spent nearly 10 years in other fields. So I was, I was not a junior, 21 year old, fresh in journalism. When I came into journalism, I was about 34, 35 years old. So from there I started. And uh, so far it, it has been, there have been, you know, uh, issues mostly inside offices, but never in that part which is being projected to the world. So that, that was my inspiration from uh, Swami Vivekananda because what we do inside does not matter because the world is not seeing that. The world is seeing what we are producing for them, news, analysis, etc. I think, I think there was one uh, question in the chat which, uh, which was about what are the books that you would recommend to read. I would think the complete works is something that is... Uh, uh, already that is an absolute must. Yeah. It will help if you know Bangla because uh, uh, Ramakrishna Mission has some very affordable books in Bangla and English. Mm. Uh, I, I would say that those who can only read Hindi are a bit disadvantaged. Uh, even while not knowing uh, Bangla, you can learn a lot from the English books that are available. And rather than going through voluminous books, if you can make it a point that every time there is a book fair in your city, you visit the stall for Ramakrishna Mission, the stall of Ramakrishna Mission, and pick some books from there. Some would be just booklets of, uh, say, 50 or 60 pages, but they would be rich in any one aspect of uh, Vedanta, one aspect from the biography of Swami Vivekananda, one aspect about their mission, one aspect about Ramakrishna, uh, one aspect about Tantra. So they have these module-specific booklets, which I find more uh, uh, useful because uh, it, it's not like a dictionary. Nobody reads a dictionary, right? People consult a dictionary. So let's say I, I have... A, something like uh, Ram Krishna Rachana the Shamukro. So there, I do not read it like I'm reading a novel. It is for research. It is for my own uh, consultation. If there is an aspect, for example, uh, his interactions with Totapuri. If I need to learn about Ramakrishna's interactions with Totapuri, I do not need to go through the entire work of Ramakrishna. So there I would only need that particular aspect. So these small booklets are about one aspect each, which is very uh, useful. So this, this would be my tip in any uh, book fair. Never forget to go make at least one visit to the Ramakrishna mission stall and pick a booklet that you can maybe finish in a day. So pick up a lot of them, maybe 12, 15, 20, any, any number of booklets you can do because you may, uh, let's be very honest about it. There are people who buy, buy thick volumes, never read them. They just became, become showpieces on the bookshelf. That, that is, that, that. Yeah, the, the one other book which I thoroughly enjoyed before I, you know, kind of, we, we go towards the close. We are, we are at the hmm. end of this, this one is the, uh, the monk is uh, the monk is man. I think that was some uh, book I thoroughly enjoyed, which traced mm. the uh, life of uh, Swami Vivekananda from a very different angle as a as a human who kind of uh, grew into divinity. It's an absolute mm. pleasure, uh, Surajit. You know, the last uh, sixty minutes we've had a thoroughly entertaining and uh, thoroughly enjoyable uh, this, uh, talk uh, followed by uh, this interaction. Uh, I would My pleasure to. Yeah, and, and th thank you for, on behalf of Swami Vivekananda Youth Movement, the Vivekananda Institute for Leadership Development and the Vivekananda Institute of Indian Studies for taking the time out and sharing your uh, thoughts with us. I would request uh, Mr. Uh, Sampath Kumar to kind of deliver a, a short uh, closing remark uh, as we end this. Uh, over to you. Thank you, uh, Ramesh. Uh, I'm audible. Just wanted to make sure. Yes, yes. Yeah, because I am, I am, link is slightly poor, so I'm only using the audio and not the video. Please excuse me. Uh, 
This has been an absolute pleasure, like Ramesh said for the last 60 minutes, of listening to somebody on two accounts. One is he stuck to the topic and didn't deviate at all, as uh, you know, Vivekananda would have really wished. I think he did waste his words on topics when the topic calls for something else and you waste it with something else, even though it might be of value. And the best part of this lecture was, you know, many of the sentences or words which uh, Tajit, you know, uh, uh, recounted were all known to us, but we never looked at it from this particular aspect at all. Simple things like brothers and sisters. Till he told, we never knew that how difficult it is to sort of say it during that time in 1894. And then who would have the courage to say we have been a land who have given shelter to persecutors and refugees. You know, who would have had the courage to say many, you know, uh, streams might go crooked or strength, but they all lead to thee. I think uh, the best part what he brought out was Vivekananda's words were not just words. They are great because they provoked people mm -hmm. into action. And those people themselves were great in their own right. For example, Jay and Tata being provoked to start an institution. And as the story goes, he even invited him to be the chair of it, which you know, Swami you know, uh, declined politely, saying that I would not be able to do it, but you should do it. So the way he inspired people and coming to the power of words, the words, if they don't provoke action, it doesn't mean anything. That's what Sarajit's, I think, final uh, you know, takeaway for us from him. We say that you can use words to inform and just be done with it. Or you can use it to make people adopt something or a reviser, an opinion. But all of them must lead to an action. I think the way Swami went about you know, making people adopt proper viewpoints and made people revise their mistaken viewpoints and more importantly, mm -hmm. provoke them into action. I think that was brought out brilliantly by Sarajit with so many very good examples. And in the Q&A session, his thing about saying that uh, science and spirituality reminded me of Einstein saying science without religion is lame and religion without science is blind and all those kind of things. So when you are a serious student of science, it's but natural you will migrate to become a spiritualist in the end. And that's the point which he brought out excellent. And more importantly, I think he spoke about why Vivekananda got the power in his words. It's because he said Ram Krishna is a man who was behind him all the time as a guru. So Ram Krishna was like a Dakshinamurti. It's not that he actually gave him big lectures, but by mere touching of him by his you know, toe or something like that, he completely transferred and that kind of a thing comes only from experience and realization. And uh, such a pleasure to have listened to this talk and confining to the boundaries of the talk, but delivering so much value, Sarajit. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sarajit, once again. And thank you, everyone, uh, for joining us. Uh, a recording of this will, uh, would be available uh, and, I, and the link will be shared uh, publicly in a short way. Thank you and have a great uh, weekend, everyone.